all right so a very good evening everyone so i welcome you all to this particular session of the discussion on the previous year questions so definitely the previous year questions uh, they play a very important role uh, in knowing us like uh, how the questions will be asked like in which particular topics the questions will be very much concentrated that is what we will be able to make out by discussing the previous year questions so now just quickly tell me am i audible and visible to all of you yes just give me a quick thumbs up like if i am audible and visible to all of you all right very good so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator all right so now what i'm try uh, what i'll be trying to discuss is uh, i am discussing some of the important topics like the previous year questions on the envenomation previous year questions on the hiv the previous year questions on some infectious diseases and previous year questions on the tuberculosis right so these are the topics which i'll be covering in this particular session okay so i'll not definitely concentrate only on the question which has been asked previously so what i have tried to do is i have taken that particular topic in and around of that particular topic i have tried to frame some of the clinical scenarios that is what we will be discussing in this particular session okay right and uh, after the completion of the session this particular pdf with annotations will be available on my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba so on this particular telegram channel you can get these particular pdf with annotations and for the daily updates related to general medicine you can follow me on my instagram handle right and my instagram handle is rajesh gubba so in this instagram handle i'll be just posting some daily updates important tables important image based questions so important updates related to the exams all that i'll be posting on my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba so you can follow me on my instagram handle so having said this let me just tell you quickly like what is going on on an academy so an academy has come up with the two important batch courses one is fmg mastery batch which is started in this particular month of february and this particular batch course will be there for 6 months and then next aspire next 2023 the students who are appearing for the next exam and this particular batch course will be there for 9 months so the prices which is there which are there they are completely subsidized prices and you can use my code that is med10 for getting 20% discount on your subscriptions right so one is your fmg mastery batch and the next one is that is next 23 batch so these are the two important batch courses which are going on on an academy and mainly the students who are appearing for neat pg march 5th exam there is another important batch course which is going on that is final booster batch so for all these batch courses you can use my code that is med10 when you will get 20% discount on your subscriptions right so having said this let me start with the first important question of the day right so you see this clinical scenario so much of these questions i have tried to frame mainly in the form of the clinical scenarios because in the recent examination rather than the single liner questions much of the questions are being like clinical based so that is the reason why i have tried to take up this clinical based questions uh jagbo jagbo singh when will you have plus classes also oh, regarding the plus classes and all you need to discuss with the management i am not sure about like the plus classes but i'll be available for you on my youtube sessions okay right so the first clinical scenario is a 32 year old man presents to your hospital with the history of working in the rice paddy and being bitten by something which is not seen uh he appears unwell and has swelling around the bite right swelling around the bite on his foot with two bite marks that are bleeding continuously what is a key test that might help you to determine the type of snake and the need for anti venom type of snake and the need for anti venom any one of you very good so this is a quick and simple very uh, easy question that is the 20 minute whole blood clotting time see a number of snakes may cause rapid envenomation with the development of coagulopathy right that can present as the prolonged bleeding from the biting site now your 20 minute whole blood clotting time is a rapid and a simple test that can provide a useful guide to the presence of the snake bite coagulopathy is it there or not that can be made out by your 20 minute whole blood clotting test okay so the investigation here is the a now what about the other options you take the blood pressure blood pressure is certainly an important test but 
an abnormal result in the blood pressure is not a specific marker for envenomation. So that is the reason why your blood pressure is being ruled out. Okay. Then what about the other options? You take the serum electrolytes. Serum electrolytes may be useful but not critical for the initial assessment. So your, your electrolytes also ruled out. Then the arterial blood gas analysis. Arterial blood gas analysis is not a critical test in the initial assessment of the snake bite. So it is not a very critical test. Now what about your extended uh, coagulation studies? See, this extended coagulation studies, they are not useful for the initial assessment. Not useful for the initial assessment. It is mainly your 20 minute whole blood clotting test. That is the one which is very much helpful for the initial assessment of the determining the type of snake and as well as the need for the antivenom. So the correct answer is A. Now what about the uh, hematotoxic snake? What are the neurotoxic snake? I will be discussing regarding the first option in detail in the subsequent questions. Now you move on to the next important clinical scenario on the same snake bite only. Right. Uh, Diksha Reddy, these are the PYQs of last 10 years, right? And these are the PYQs of the NEAT PG, INICT, and previously you used to have an exam called AIMS, separate exam, and you used, used to have an exam called PG. So these are the questions for, of the last 10 years of these all different exams, okay? Right. Now, considering the above patient, right, that paddy field snake bite, considering the above patient he, uh, has come somewhere from India or Sri Lanka, given the particular circumstances of this bite and that testing showed the coagulopathy, testing showed coagulopathy, which of the following venomous animals would be most likely as a cause of this bite? Cobra, Indian red scorpion, crate, Russell swiper, saw scale viper. Right. So what do you think is the correct answer? Right. So no, 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 no. It is not the crate here. It is the Russell swiper. Hmm? It is the Russell swiper. Now, what are your hematotoxic snakes? So what is the problem here? Coagulopathy. So what are your hematotoxic snakes, particularly in India? The hematotoxic snakes, particularly in India, the most common one will be the Russell swiper. And even you have the other snakes like saw scale viper and as well as various pit viper species. But the most common, particularly in India, will be Russell swiper. That is hematotoxic snake. Now, what about the other snakes? Like you take crate and you take cobra. And see, these are the neurotoxic snakes. Right? These are the neurotoxic snakes. Okay? So, like the one, if the test is telling you that it is coagulopathy coming from India, the most important snake that you need to consider is the Russell swiper. And that too in the paddy field. Hmm? That too in the paddy field okay and what can be the presentation of this Russell swiper along with coagulopathy in certain areas these patients they can present with acute renal failure as well hmm? can present with acute renal failure as well okay now you take this saw scale viper even that also can cause coagulopathy but it tend to inhabit the dry areas rather than paddy fields see what what is the clinical scenario in our question the patient is in the rice paddy field in the rice paddy field the snake which is having a, a inhabitant is the russell swiper which will be causing coagulopathy now what about this particular saw scale viper it is also the one which can cause coagulopathy but it tend to inhabit the dry areas rather than the paddy fields okay that is the reason why you are so scale viper is not the correct answer. Whereas your cobra, it do not cause the coagulopathy. Even your crate do not cause coagulopathy. And even your Indian red scorpion, that also does not cause the coagulopathy. So that is the reason why the answer here is the Russell swiper. And one more question on the same uh, topic of the snake bite itself. Okay. So now the abo patient, right? The same abo patient. Like what has been found is... He has been clearly envenomed and needs antivenom urgently. In giving him antivenom, which is the most important drug that has to be available along with antivenom? Adrenaline, antihistamine, dopamine, hydrocortisone, prajosin. So along with antivenom, what is that particular drug which should be available along with the antivenom? Any one of you please? Yes. Uh, Okay, some of you have answered hydrocortisone. 
right so uh, the correct answer is not exactly the hydrocortisone it is the adrenaline now why is that adrenaline should be available whenever you are giving the anti venom the greatest risk when giving anti venom is an anaphylactic reaction right it is the anaphylactic reaction right which if not correctly managed may prove fatal right it can be very much fatal so managing anaphylaxis requires a multifaceted approach but the key drug is adrenaline in most instances it is being administered intramuscularly right so adrenaline should always be immediately available in an appropriate doses prior to giving any anti venom right so prior to giving uh, given giving any anti venom it is not that you should be giving adrenaline it should be available it should be available now what about the other options what about the other options you take this hydrocortisone some of you have answered the hydrocortisone see hydrocortisone and as well as the antihistamines have also been suggested as pre medications prior to giving anti venom but clinical trial evidence does not support their use okay one minute right so yeah so but the clinical trial evidence does not support their evidence of usage of the hydrocortisone and antihistamine prior to giving any anti venom now what about this prazosin prazosin in the past it has been recommended treatment for envenomation by indian red scorpion okay so that is about your prazosin story now what about this dopamine dopamine might be required in managing intractable hypotension but it is not an alternative to adrenaline as a drug of first choice in treating anaphylaxis only if there is intractable hypotension then definitely the dopamine will be the drug that can be added here okay right so that is about the story related to the anaphylaxis that can happen whenever you give the anti venom where you need to keep adrenaline available okay next one more question on the same snake bite it's a very easy question for a forest cobra bite right nasa which of the following is likely to be the most useful and effective first aid most useful and effective first aid if applied correctly electric shock pressure bandage and immobilization which we call it as the pbi none of these is listed tourniquet test yes any one of you very good dark knight so the correct answer is the pbi that is pressure bandage and as well as the immobilization right pressure bandage and immobilization now let me tell you this particular cobra it will cause the principally flaccid neurotoxic paralysis without major local tissue damage it will not cause major local tissue damage around the bite site and it will cause flaccid neurotoxic paralysis therefore the most important consideration is slowing venom movement from the bite side to the rest of the body a process that initially occurs particularly via the lymphatic system so via the lymphatic system there is chance of passage of the venom so how can you arrest that passage of the venom that is by your pressure bandage and as well as the immobilization right now this pressure is applied to the bite area and as well as the bitter limb and it has the potential for bites by the snakes causing extensive bite site tissue injury now please let me tell you in those snakes which will cause extensive bite site injury in this snakes you should just provide only immobilization right you should just provide immobilization yes yes uh, kapil pata just by pressure bandage definitely it is possible to arrest the spread of the venom through the lymphatics okay but again in which particular snake bites you can do this pressure bandages where there is no local site injury where there is no local tissue injury there you can apply the pressure bandage but your pressure bandage is not recommended for those particular snakes which will be causing local tissue injury right for those snakes which will be causing local tissue injury simple immobilization of the bitten limb is recommended instead now what about this particular tourniquet this is what very commonly we see in the uh, routine practice see tourniquets while effective in short term in preventing the venom movement 
but these particular tourniquets are painful and have a well established reputation for causing major ischemic limb, limb injury so this tourniquets for prolonged time can cause ischemic limb injury often requiring amputation therefore tourniquets are not recommended first aid for any snake bite okay so no tourniquets right now what about this electric shock electric electric shock treatment for snake bite has been proven to cause injury and provides no benefit it should never be used as first aid for any envenomation so that is about your the first aid treatment like what you can do for a cobra bite okay right so these are some of the questions related to the envenomation yeah uh, yes varun kashyap what is that sir is in pressure bandage uh like no no see tourniquet is what it is like a rope right it is like a rope where you will be applying the bandage in one particular site that to very tightly but what about the pressure bandage the pressure bandage you will be applying to this particular entire area where it will not be causing the compression of a single vessel but with your tourniquet can cause the compression of the single vessel causing reduced blood supply to the limb and may require even amputation as well right so both of them are not the same so pressure bandage you are applying for a wider area whereas tourniquet when you are applying a, a, in a local area there is high chance of compressing a vessel okay right now having said this okay some of the questions on the topic of the hiv in some of the questions on the topic of the hiv so a 37 year old man because uh, this particular topic of hiv i have taken up uh, particularly because in my telegram channel some of the students have asked me to discuss on the to discuss the questions on hiv and tuberculosis so that is the reason why in this particular session i have taken some of the questions on hiv and tuberculosis so a 37 year old man with cd4 count of how much 24 cells per cubic millimeter presents with painless progressive visual loss okay on fundoscopy the vitreous is clear and hemorrhages and exudates are seen on the retina what is the most likely diagnosis cytomegalovirus retinitis hiv retinopathy ocular syphilis ocular toxoplasmosis progressive outer retinal necrosis due to varicella zoster virus uh ocular toxoplasmosis mm, no no see the correct answer here is the cytomegalovirus retinitis so cytomegalovirus retinitis it is the commonest cause of the visual loss in hiv right commonest cause of the visual loss in hiv then what about the other options you take your toxoplasmosis often causes a concomitant vitreitis so this toxoplasmosis it will cause concomitant vitreitis and even your hiv retinopathy both of these this hiv retinopathy and ocular toxoplasmosis which can occur in hiv these they don't cause visual loss right there is no visual loss with your toxoplasmosis and as well as the hiv retinopathy so that is the reason why your hiv retinopathy and ocular toxoplasmosis is ruled out so painless visual loss in hiv very commonly is the cmv retinitis a very very important question now some one question we will take up quickly related to the management what is the mechanism of action of the antiviral drug raltigravir dolitigravir lvt gravir any one of you ccr5 antagonist fusion inhibitor integrase inhibitor protease inhibitor reverse transcriptase inhibitor so if you take the standard treatment of antiretroviral therapy what is the standard treatment like we give two nrtis right along with that we give one nnr no 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 only some of you are answering correctly okay right so along with this we add non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or integrase inhibitor or the protease inhibitor right or the protease inhibitor so these are the drugs right now the one your uh, raltigravir dolitigravir and eltigravir they are the integrase inhibitors they inhibit the integration of the hiv nuclear material with the human uh, dna that is what is your integrase inhibitor right now you take all the list of drugs like let me just quickly recap all the list of drugs okay so if you take all these drugs 
like we have the NNRTIs, sorry, NRTIs first, that is abacavir, emtricitabine, lamivudin, tinofovir, and as well as zidovudin. So I said you, like we need to combine, I mean, we need to give two NRTIs. What are those two NRTIs we usually combine? We give emtricitabine or lamivudin, we don't give both. Emtricitabine and lamivudin, they are not given both because they have same mechanism of action. Along with emtricitabine or lamivudin, we combine either abicavir or tinofovir or zidovidin. Okay. To this particular combination, we add one NNRTI or one integrase inhibitor or one protease inhibitor. So this is what is being added. Now, if you take the examples of NNRTIs, that is efavirenz and as well as nevirapine. The protease inhibitors, that is adazanavir, darunavir and as well as lopinavir. Integrase inhibitors, they all end with word gravir. Right? All they end with gravir. Okay? Then CCR5 inhibitors, that is maraviroc. Okay? So these are the examples of the antiretroviral drugs. Right? Now, we move on to the next question related to the HIV itself. A 44-year-old woman with CD4 count of 73 cells per cubic millimeter presents with a progressive left hemiplegia and headache over a week. Her MRI shows multiple ring enhancing mass lesions. That is a very, very important point in a HIV patient with surrounding cerebral edema. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this case? Hmm, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this case? Very good, Shweta Kaswa. So, that is cerebral toxoplasmosis. The commonest cause of multiple intracranial space occupying lesions with HIV infection with CD4 count of less than 100, that will be your cerebral toxoplasmosis, right? CD4 count less than 100 and multiple intracranial space occupying lesion. Blindly remember, it is your cerebral toxoplasmosis, okay? And next question is on the topic of iris. Iris is another very, very important area in the HIV uh, where the questions can be as, uh, expected. What is the correct statement regarding the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome? First option, antiretroviral therapy should be stopped if iris is suspected. It is more common in patients responding poorly to antiretroviral therapy. Third option, it is more common when ART is initiated with higher baseline CD4 values. It is usually present within three months of initiating the uh, ART, uh, please explain the CD4 count and infection. Okay, dark night. I'll just do that dark night. Just give me some time. And the mortality is high, appropriately 25%. So what do you think is the correct statement here? Yes. Okay. So we have the correct answer from Bharadwaj. Hmm, very good Bharadwaj. So the answer is D. Now if you take this iris, that is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, what, <coughs> what exactly is it? <coughs> it's an exaggerated inflammatory response. Right? It's an exaggerated inflammatory response that is seen within first three months of starting the antiretroviral therapy. Okay, And it is most common in patients starting ART with low CD4 count. It is not high baseline CD4 count. It should be, right, it should be low CD4 count. And it is usual to continue ART and provide symptomatic relief. So, ART should be stopped is a wrong statement. You have to continue ART, right? Only you need to give symptomatic relief. And, and the drugs that can be provided is the steroids, Right, the drugs that can be provided is steroids. And it is more common in patients uh, responding poorly to ART, wrong. Mortality being 25% being wrong. Okay, so the, the steroids may be useful in life-threatening manifestations of the iris, where the outcome can be good whenever you give this particular steroids. So the correct answer here is D. It is usually present within three months of initiating the antiretroviral therapy. Now we move on to the next question. Right. A 26-year-old woman with newly diagnosed HIV infection and CD4 plus count of 34 cells per cubic millimeter presents with dysphagia. There is no oral candidiasis. Right? There is no oral candidiasis. You prescribe a course of fluconazole for possible 
Candida esophagitis. Two weeks later, she returns with no improvement. What is the most likely cause of her dysphagia? Cytomegalovirus, esophageal ulceration, herpes simplex virus, esophageal ulceration, Kaposi's sarcoma of the esophagus, major after ulcerations of the esophagus, esophagitis to azole resistant Candida species. Yes, any one of you? Okay, so I did not get the correct answer for, uh, from any one of you. Now, let me tell you, in case of patients with the HIV, with CD4 count less than 100, with dysphagia, de definitely what is the one of the very, very important cause? One of the very, very important cause is the candida esophagitis. But the patient did not respond to the azoles. Okay, so candida esophagitis is the commonest cause, but failure to respond in this case virtually rules this out. Okay, so azole resistant candida species are usually only seen in patients with prolonged azole therapy. Now, candida esophagitis is ruled out, right? Now, because uh, it is not like the individual had a prolonged azole therapy. There is no particular history saying that the individual had a prolonged azole therapy. So, your E is ruled out. Esophagitis to azole resistant candida species is ruled out. Which group of patients can develop azole resistant candida species? It is seen only in patients with prolonged azole therapy. That is not given in our history. Now, the next most common cause is major after ulceration of the esophagus, which responds well with steroids, right? Which responds well with steroids and as well as the antiretroviral therapy. So, the correct answer here is the D. Hmm, the character. So, please remember, first common cause with dysphagia in HIV patients with low CD4 count, candida esophagitis. Not responding to your azole therapy, then consider azole resistant if the individual had a prolonged history of the azole intake. If there is no prolonged history of azole intake, what is the second most common cause for dysphagia in HIV patients with low CD4 count? That will be the aftus ulceration of the esophagus. That is the second most common cause. So, the correct answer is D here, right? Now, having said this, we we'll move on to the next question. Okay. A 39-year-old man presents with asymmetrical cervical lymphadenopathy for two months. His CD4 count is 234 cells per cubic millimeter. The largest node is 4 into 3 centimeter and is fluctuant. This point is very, very important for me. Is fluctuant. Several nodes, right, several nodes are matted together. That is another important point. What is the most likely diagnosis in this clinical scenario? Non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, no. Dark night, you are right. That is tuberculosis. Okay. See, once you get a point saying that the lymph nodes are matted and fluctuant, it is your tuberculosis. Whereas you take your malignant uh, lymph nodes. See, malignant lymph nodes, they rarely fluctuate. And this malignant lymph nodes, there is the central necrosis. Only when there is central necrosis, then they become fluctuant. Otherwise, they are not fluctuant. Okay. Now, you take this, the HIV lymphadenopathy. Persistent generalized lymphadenopathy of HIV is typically symmetrical and does not fluctuate. What is given to us? Asymmetrical cervical lymphadenopathy is given. Whereas your HIV lymphadenopathy, which is nothing but your persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, it is typically symmetrical. And these lymph nodes, they are not fluctuant. So that is the reason why your HIV lymphadenopathy is being ruled out. Okay. Now we move on to the next question. So the correct answer here is the tuberculosis. Okay. Regarding the Kaposi sarcoma, definitely very, very important area in the HIV to be discussed. Which of the following statements is correct about the AIDS associated Kaposi sarcoma? The options are it is a spindle cell tumor of lympho endothelial origin, it is associated with infection by HHV6, multiple skin lesions indicate a poor prognosis, the commonest site of the visceral spread is a brain. Right, so the correct answer here is 
right so those whoever has answered a is correct now let me tell you this kaposi's sarcoma it is a spindle cell tumor of the lymphoendothelial origin right and what is the route of transmission all forms of kaposi's sarcoma are due to sexually transmitted disease and what is that particular virus that is the hhv8 which is also known as kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus and this aids associated kaposi sarcoma is always multicentric disease right multicentric disease early mucocutaneous lesions are macular and may may be difficult to diagnose and as the disease progresses the skin lesions become more numerous and as well as larger so multiple skin lesions indicating the poor prognosis is not the true statement right it is not the true statement so early in the early stage itself right there may be multiple cutaneous lesions which are like slightly difficult to diagnose okay and what about the the yeah what about the commonest spread see lymphedema is common as lymphatic vessels are infiltrated and kaposi sarcoma only commonly spreads to lymph nodes and viscerally especially to lungs and gastrointestinal tract so it is not the brain it is to the gastrointestinal tract and as well as to the lungs okay so the correct answer is it is a spindle cell tumor of the lympho endothelial origin and the organism is hhv8 multiple skin lesion indicating poor prognosis is a wrong statement commonest site of visible spread will be gat and as well as lungs and the next important question last question on the hiv right hiv is definitely a very very important area for the questions right definitely one or two questions can be expected which of the following feature is the characteristic of the hiv associated nephropathy which is nothing but high one heavy proteinuria is a usual finding severe hypertension is a characteristic feature small kidneys or ultrasound are typically seen when creatinine clearance decreases to less than 30 the course of the disease is relatively benign with progressing to end stage renal failure right so what do you think is the correct statement regarding your hiv associated nephropathy any one of you uh, no it is not d it is not a benign course hmm? it is a rapid course okay so now let me tell you this hiv associated nephropathy typically presents with right typically presents with nephrotic syndrome and which form of nephrotic syndrome is caused by your high one that is hiv associated nephropathy that is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis so these patients they present with heavy proteinuria mm, they present with heavy proteinuria and this focal segmental glomerulosclerosis can progress to chronic kidney disease now what will be the size of the kidneys in these individuals see in case of the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis which is a reflux nephropathy there will be hydronephrotic kidney there will be hydronephrosis or there can be normal sized kidney but small size kidneys will not be there and this severe hypertension is a characteristic feature is an incorrect statement hypertension may or may not be there or there can be even normal blood pressure in these patients with hiv associated nephropathy then what about this benign course see the course of the disease is relatively rapid it is not benign in case of hiv associated nephropathy right yes dark night your focal segmental glomerulosclerosis right so it is your hiv associated nephropathy which is a collapsing variant you are right so that is about the questions related to hiv now let me discuss some of the questions related to the tuberculosis right so these are some of the pyqs asked on the hiv now let me take up the questions related to the tuberculosis combining with hiv now a 53 year old lawyer who is the having the hiv zero positive medical status right see hiv positive zero medical status which reveals a positive interferon gamma release assay right igra is positive showing t cells reactive to mycobacterium tuberculosis antigen he is asymptomatic and chest x ray is reported as negative which of these most accurately describe the micro mycobacterial status active pulmonary disease commensal flora extra pulmonary infection latent infection opportunistic infection now what do you think is the correct statement here any one of you what is the correct statement regarding this particular patient uh no
No, I did not get the correct answer from any one of you. Now, the very, very important point in this question is, I have highlighted here, that is interferon gamma release assay is positive. Now, when interferon gamma release assay is positive, it tells the latent infection. Very good, Soumya. So, the correct answer is the latent infection. See, the test results with positive interferon gamma release assay with no symptoms. The patient is asymptomatic, right? You see here, asymptomatic and no evidence of the active disease, chest x-ray is also negative, right? Chest x-ray is also negative. So that tells that there is no evidence of active disease and this particular points to the latent infection. So how can you make out that there is a latent infection in an individual with the tuberculosis by doing your interferon gamma release assay? Interferon gamma release assay, if it is like positive with asymptomatic nature and chest x-ray being negative, it tells you that it's a latent infection. Okay. Now, you take this active pulmonary tuberculosis. See, active pulmonary and extra pulmonary disease would have signs and symptoms of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Right. So, that is the reason why. And your mycobacterium tuberculosis would not be found as the commensal flora anytime. Right. And there is no extra pulmonary infection because the individual is completely asymptomatic. And what about this opportunistic infection? Yes, it might be opportunistic infection, but that doesn't mean that your interferon gamma release assay should be positive. Interferon gamma release assay, if it is positive, it tells that the individual is having the latent infection. Okay. So the correct answer is uh, yes, Abhishek, you're right. Now, we'll move on to the next question, right? So, yes, this is very interesting and this is a question related to infectious disease, okay? Now, so, a 35-year-old doctor returns to visit his family in rural India. This point is very, very important for me, rural India. Two weeks later, he develops fever, which, is, which progresses over a number of days to high-grade fever. Even this point is also very, very important to me. Progresses over a number of days to high-grade fever. In association with profound malaise, he develops a dry cough and subsequent diarrhea. On examination, the spleen tip is palpable. This point is also important. Blood cultures ideally a gram negative rod, which is still being identified to be to the species level, while antimicrobial sensitivities are being determined. Which of the following antimicrobial agents should form the initial empirical treatment in this patient? Okay, the options are ceftriaxone, chloramphenicol, ciprofloxacin, coamoxifen, or quatrimoxazole. Yeah. Can anyone tell me what particular infection is this patient suffering with? <laughs> what particular infection is this patient suffering with? Okay, so some of you have answered ceftriaxone, some of you have answered ciprofloxacin, but can anyone tell me what is the infection this particular patient is suffering with? So very good. So this particular patient is suffering with typhoid. So what are the points to tell that the individual is suffering with typhoid? Rural India. Fever progressing over a number of days to a high grade fever. That means step ladder pattern, diarrhea, splenomegaly, gram negative rod. All these points. I'm sorry, one second. Right. So, all these points towards your typhoid, which tells the first line drug here will be ceftriaxone. Okay. So, the likely diagnosis is typhoid fever. Right? And antimicrobial resistance is increasing, meaning many agents formerly used are no longer active, like your chloramphenicol, ciprofloxacin, the coamaxiclop, like they are not useful now. Ceftriaxone is the most reasonable initial choice for the salmonella typhi. Okay? Yes, you take this particular salmonella typhi, it can cause the respiratory manifestations in the form of your dry cough. It can cause in the form of dry cough. Okay? Now, right, moving to the next question. Very interesting question and let me see how many of you can answer this. A 34-year-old woman who takes prednisolone and azathioprine for control of her Crohn's disease presents with a 10-day history of headache and double vision. On examination, she has meningism and third nerve palsy, right? Headache, double vision, meningism, third nerve palsy. CSF showed, just one second. Yeah. Right. So CSF showed 
white cells, 500 cells per cubic millimeter, which are predominantly lymphocytes. An elevated protein and low glucose. Special stains and antigen tests are negative. What is the likeliest infecting organism? Uh, Cryptococcus, Listeria, Neisseria, Strep Pneumonia. Uh, yes, Shiva, you have answered Strep Pneumonia. Oh, no. Strep Pneumonia, you should not even think in your dreams also. Why? Because Strep Pneumonia, it will be neutrophilic predominant. It is not lymphocytic predominant. Okay. Now, let me tell you the correct answer. No, I did not get the correct answer from any one of you. So, it is not Cryptococcus, it is not your Neisseria, it is your Listeria monocytogenous. Now, let me explain to you why it is Listeria monocytogenous. Now, so this patient is immunocompromised. So, the patient is taking the prednisolone and azathioprine therapy. So, immunocompromised host, immunocompromised host. What are the organisms? Tuberculosis you can think of. Cryptococcus you can think of. The other organism that you need to think of is Listeria. Tuberculosis is not there, so take out your tuberculosis. What about your cryptococcus and listeria? So listeria, it should be considered in immunocompromised host. And not only that, listeria is also very common in pregnancy and as well as in people around 55 years of age. And in listeria, you will have that lymphocytic predominant. And even in cryptococcus, you have that lymphocytic predominant. Okay. Now, if it is Listeria, what is the drug of choice? See, treatment with ampicillin as it is inherently resistant to cephalosporin. Ampicillin is one which you can give. Okay. Now, what about your cryptococcus? Right. See, cryptococcus disease is often associated with lower cell numbers. But anyways, how much is the cell? CD4 count? Sorry, CD4 count is not mentioned here. So, rule out. Okay. So, usually associated with low CD4 count and cryptococcus, your special stain that is indiaing stain will be positive, right? And your cryptococcal antigen test will be positive if it is cryptococcus. So, your special stain and antigen tests are negative. That will rule out your cryptococcus. That will rule out your cryptococcus. So, that is the reason why the answer is the listeria monocytogenous. So, please remember, listeria should be considered in immunocompromised host, pregnancy and as well as people over 55 years of age. Okay. So, and in listeria, you can have that lymphocytic predominant and that is what is the picture in case of listeria. And what about your Neisseria? See, in case of your Neisseria, it's a bacterial infection. Right? So, it will be neutrophilic predominant. Even your streptococcus, it is neutrophilic predominant. It is not lymphocytic predominant. Okay? Right. So, that was about the listeria. Now, the next question. A 32-year-old man presents with a 5-day history of left-sided pleuritic chest pain, fever, cough, productive of rusty sputum. Rusty sputum. Okay. Observation shows the blood pressure 100 by 60, pulse rate 105 beats per minute, temperature 38.2, respiratory rate 21 breaths per minute, oxygen saturation 87% on room air. Examination reveals dullness to percussion and bronchial breathing on the left side. Nasolabial cold sores are noted. Which organism is likely to be responsible for this? Aspergillus, HSV, mycobacterium, tuberculosis, PCP, strep pneumonia. What do you think is the correct answer? Okay, so definitely your HSV is very much tempting. Uh, yes, Saumya, drug of choice for Listeria monocytogenesis will be ampicillin. Hmm, that will be ampicillin. Okay, right. So, but the answer is not the HSV. It is your streptococcus pneumonia. Now, the entire picture, if you take, you take number one, rusty sputum. Cough with rusty sputum. And second important thing is the presence of dullness on percussion and bronchial breathing. So, what do you think all these suggestive of? All these suggestive of the lobar pneumonia. Mm, all these are suggestive of the lobar pneumonia. And the organism which is causing lobar pneumonia here is streptococcus pneumonia. Now, what about your HSV? Some of you have answered HSV. Why? See, HSV is likely to cause the cold source. Mm, the HSV is likely to cause the cold source. Okay. Right. And this HSV, the one which is causing cold sores, that frequently accompany this streptococcal infection. Hmm? 
that frequently accompany the streptococcal infection. Okay. So, but what is the question asked? The organism responsible for this presentation of respiratory are predominant symptoms here. So, that is the reason why the organism is strep pneumonia. Now, what about your PCP pneumonia? PCP pneumonia, you don't have the cough with expectoration. It's a dry cough. Right? It's a dry cough and exertional breathlessness. And in PCP pneumonia, commonly seen in immunocompromised individuals or nowadays it is called Pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia. Now, what about your mycobacterium tuberculosis? So, the history. So, it is just only five-day history. Right? Mycobacterium tuberculosis rarely presents acutely. Rarely presents acutely. And not only that, this mycobacterium tuberculosis, this will mainly cause the upper lobe pneumonia. Mainly cause the upper lobe pneumonia. Right? So, here it is not being clearly mentioned where exactly is your pneumonia, but the acute presentation is not very common in case of mycobacterium. Now, you take your aspergillus. Aspergillus can cause lobar pneumonia, but usually in the context of an underlying lung disease. Right? Usually in the context of an underlying lung disease. Okay? And But in aspergillus socket, again, the individual should be the immunocompromised host. Okay? Immunocompromised host. Right? There is no point of the immunocompromisation story in our patient. So, your aspergillus is also ruled out. Okay? So, that is the reason why the answer here is the strep pneumonia. Right? Now, the last question. Right. So, a 54-year-old man is due to is due to start the monoclonal antibody. That means he wanted to start monoclonal antibody-based uh, therapy for active Crohn's disease. But the radiologist has noted a minor abnormality on the patient's recent chest x-ray. The patient had BCG vaccination in childhood and no known TB contacts. Right? Has no known TB contacts. He has no respiratory symptoms. Local guidance suggests checking an interferon gamma on peripheral blood sample. Which of the following statements is true regarding the interferon gamma release assay? The options are a positive result should prompt the clinician to start ATT. It is more specific than tuberculin skin testing. It is now the first line test for diagnosis of active tuberculosis. It is only positive when there is systemic mycobacterial infection. It measures the release of interferon alpha from the sensitized T cells. Uh, Shiva, it is not interferon alpha, Shiva. It will measure interferon gamma. So, your E is ruled out. Okay. Now, what about the story of your interferon gamma? So, we have the dark night answering it correctly. So, this interferon gamma release assay, uh, it is very much important in case of latent infection. Hmm? Very much important in the latent infection. And it can be positive even in active tuberculosis also. But its significance is mainly for latent infection. Right? But this particular interferon gamma it should not be used as the first line diagnostic test. What is the first line diagnostic test? That is your CBNAT. Okay, that is cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. And even your interferon gamma is not used as the first line diagnostic test. And it is not the one which will tell you to start anti tubercular therapy. No. So, your A, C and the it is positive only when there is systemic bacterial infection? No. It is positive in case of latent tuberculosis. It is positive even in active tuberculosis. So, your option D is ruled out. What is the correct answer? Your interferon gamma, gamma release assay is more specific than the tuberculin skin test. Right? But your if your interferon gamma release assay is positive, that doesn't mean that you need to start anti-T. ATT. That doesn't mean that the patient is having the active tuberculosis only. That doesn't mean that the patient is having only systemic infection and it is not the one which is released from inter uh, it is not the one which is uh, telling you about interferon alpha it will tell you about the interferon gamma. But remember your interferon gamma release assay it is more specific then compared to that of your the tuberculin skin test. So these are some of the questions related to the HIV and as well as the tuberculosis, right? And the other thing like which I have tried to concentrate in this particular topic is the envenomation.
right in animation okay so with this i'll try to wind up this particular session of the previous year questions part 3 now this particular uh, pdf with annotations you can get it from my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba so in the further sessions also please let me know what are the topics you want me to discuss specifically i'll try to discuss the previous year questions of that particular topics which you want okay now this particular topic has been discussed that is hiv tuberculosis because some of the students in my telegram channel have asked me to discuss the topic related to hiv and tuberculosis so that is the reason why the some of the important questions related to hiv and tuberculosis i have discussed in this particular session right so i wish you all the best for your exams and do well and definitely this is the uh, last few days you have another maybe uh, you know 18 days or like uh, uh, 17 days which are being left out okay so these particular few days are the very very important days where you need to stay very strong you need to believe you are in yourself that i can definitely clear this exam with my desired rank one of the very important doubt many of the students usually will be getting is whether i will be able to clear the exam or not that particular thought itself will ruin your preparation so it is not very easy for a student who is appearing for third time or fourth time to develop that particular attitude but the life is a process where you have to keep the positive thoughts in your mind that is the only one which will help you to clear your exam and to make your path very easy and as well as smooth once you get a doubt that whether i'll be able to clear or not that makes a very very difficult for you to clear your exam so wipe off all those particular thoughts whether i'll be able to clear the exam or not now the another important doubt many of the students get is about the recall whether i will be able to recall these particular topics during my exam trust me one important point you keep on revising as many number of times as possible that you can definitely you will be able to recall in your exam don't keep an iota of doubt also whether i be able to recall or not when you have done a good number of revisions if you have not done a good number of revisions or if you have not solved your previous year questions definitely you should get a doubt whether i be able to recall or not but if you have done an adequate number of revisions definitely please remember that you will get a good recall in your exam so it is this particular last moment of time solving your previous year questions doing as many number of revisions as possible is a very very important part of your preparation and in this last few days don't try to experiment with any of the new topics right new topics jo bhi hai chhod do right don't try to experiment with any of the new topics at this moment of time right and concentrate and try to revise your notes don't try to do a research on some new materials try to do the revision from the notes which you have been following since last 9 to 10 months that is the gold standard for your preparation don't try to go for new material right new concepts new topics to be started at this particular point of time don't do that at all and the very very important point as i have said you don't lose your confidence right don't give up at this moment of time you have put an extreme effort since last 9 to 10 months and this is the time definitely you will be getting your dream branch if you consistently put your effort right so you the entire country is waiting for you to write this particular exam and get in a desirable rank wherein you will be coming out with the colorful rank okay so that positive attitude that confidence is very very important in this last moment of your preparation be confident be strong believe in yourself definitely you will clear your exam right so with this i'll wind up this particular session and see you in the upcoming sessions okay